Welcome to another Family Bible Study. Again, we have the privilege of, and a pleasure actually, of looking into the Word of God to discover truth. And I find in my own personal pilgrimage that there is never, never an end to the truth that pours forth from the Word of God. And that should not be unexpected because after all the Bible is the reflection of God's infinite mind it is a superb law book that God has given to us and in it he has set forth all the laws not only how we are to live but also the laws that govern his whole program and that's why as we're studying Jeremiah 5 right now and we've been in Jeremiah for some time we discover that God is prophesying not first of all about what was going to happen to to uh, uh, the Ju Judah in the days of Jeremiah but in the first instance he was prophesying what was going to happen right near the end of the world during the time of the great tribulation during the time of the end of the church age and he was simply using uh, Judah as, an, as a, a tremendous example of how he would do with the church. And you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the Jehovah God of the Bible. And therefore, when we read how he dealt with ancient Israel or ancient Judah, we can uh, get a very, very clear insight how what we can expect as he deals with uh, those who uh, claim to be believers in this day and who are not truly believers because at any time in Israel's history most of them claim to be believers but very few actually were believers now as we've been going on in Jeremiah 5 uh, we we uh, uh, came down to verse 20 uh, actually the context is that that uh, God is is using ugly language to emphasize his wrath upon the local congregations typified by ancient Judah that was to be uh, conquered by Babylon in 587 BC uh, and uh, and he amongst other things in verse 20 and we this is what we talked about in our last study he said declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah publish it in Judah in other words this is to be proclaimed uh, to the whole world for that matter but also uh, it's to be proclaimed in such a way that churches and congregations all over the world might hear this because they spiritually call themselves Judah they spiritually call themselves Jacob they are the Israel of God they claim and so they should hear but the next verse verse 21 is a very ominous verse again and uh, as we've been going through Jeremiah, I guess we go from one ominous verse to another. But in Jeremiah 5, verse 21, God says, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not, fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual degree, and so on. Now, when we look at this verse 21, we find that it is a very, very important verse. It, well, come on, every time we find another important verse, <laughs> every verse turns out to be very important. But as we're going along verse by verse and carefully looking at each one, suddenly uh, the verse in question begins to uh, 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 ring bells all over the place and begins to be saying things that we never suspected were there. Uh, because you see, this verse is really tying into a number of other statements very, very similar and actually is part of a solution to a real problem that we read about in Matthew 13, you've heard about the parable of the wheat and the tares. And, uh, and uh, in that parable of the wheat and tares, it talks about first binding the, uh, the tares and preparing them for burning. And, and uh, then the wheat will be gathered into the barn. And uh, through the years, that has always been a very puzzling statement. How can that happen if that's all happening at the end of the world, isn't it true that first the 
uh, that the believers are raptured and then the uh, the unbelievers typified by terrors are burned and how are we to understand that well now as we have been patiently going through various parts of the Bible a lot of these phrases and verses are beginning to become more and more clear there we're beginning to see how they fit together very very precisely and uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that parable of the wheat and tares and go through that. And, and as we do that, we're going to find that that parable also ties back into this verse 21. Hear now this, O, J, o uh, foolish people and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. And we're going to learn that this is uh, uh, an integral part of how God binds the tares. Now let's go to Matthew 13, and we're going to patiently uh, go through this and see what we can learn. Matthew 13, we read in verse, verse 24 of Matthew 13, And there are another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And while men slept, his, an enemy came, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat with them, let both grow all together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. And then he uh, gives us the meaning of this, uh, at least some of the meaning, because after all, every phrase in the Bible has meaning, but God at least gets us on the right track. As he says in verse uh, it's 37, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right, now there's the parable. And it's curious that this parable is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. Sometimes God, but so is the parable of the vineyard only found in Matthew. And, and uh, uh, it's this... Uh, whether it's only found once or and some of the parables are found twice but many of the parables are only found in the gospel of Matthew but that's not significant at all because Matthew is just as much a part of the Bible as any other any other book of the Bible but here he's talking about wheat and tares now we can immediately know that wheat in this context has to do with the uh, uh, those who are true believers they and the tares we can quickly understand are weeds that look so much like the wheat they look so much like the wheat that it's virtually impossible to tell them or tell the tare from the wheat or the weed from the wheat it, they they look virtually identical so identical that you have to wait until the harvest in order to separate them. And here God is, uh, is telling us about a separation about the, of the wheat and the tares. Now, the wheat, we know, are to be found where? 
Where are the true believers to be found? They're to be found in the local congregations. That is the purpose of the local congregation. It is to, to sow the seed of the gospel. And in this context, God also says that the, that in, in one part of it, that the seed are the true believers. Because you see, as we as we sow the seed of the gospel, it's already identified with the true believers, given the fact that the true believers were elected of God. They're an integral part of God's possible, whole plan of salvation. And but at the same time, that that God is sowing the seed. Uh, and uh, they uh, begin to show up as wheat in the local congregations. An enemy comes who is the devil. And he is, we read here, is, uh, is also sowing seed. We read in verse uh, 25, While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. All right, now I want to stop right here. Because right here, God is giving us an understanding of how Satan has worked within the congregations throughout the church age. If we go back to the days of the synagogues and the temple, we find there that the, the situation became so bad that finally, virtually nobody is becoming saved. As I've said many, many times, as Jesus brought the gospel for three and a half years, virtually nobody became saved. But Satan was very, very active. And you'll remember, let me refresh our memory with Luke, eight, Luke chapter 8. And, and what happened? As the perfect gospel was being proclaimed, and isn't it true in Isaiah 55 that, that uh, where God says that God's word will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent, it will not return void. And we, that's as much as we have really known. We haven't recognized fully that there's two requirements for the gospel to take root in the life of the true believer. The first requirement is that the gospel has to be faithfully proclaimed. The second requirement is that God himself will apply that gospel to the heart of those that he plans to save, who are the elect. All right, now here we see in Luke 8, where God is talking about the parable of the sower, and we read in verse 12, we read in verse 12 of Luke 8, those by the wayside, that is, some seed fell by the wayside, and uh, it never penetrated the hearts of the soil that uh, God is, is typifying uh, as the hearts uh, in, uh, of those who hear the gospel. And then cometh the devil... The devil, now you see how that relates to Matthew 13, where it says that the devil sowed something. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Well, I, that, that's why we see that, that the Holy Spirit had to be poured out. In other words... As long as Jesus was preaching, the devil was very active. We've talked about this before, but this is a very big truth, and we have to understand it. As long as Jesus was preaching perfect sermons, perfect word of God, the hearers had very good physical ears. They could hear him preach, and he preached to the thousands, to the multitudes. And yet, when we study the Bible, virtually nobody became saved. There are a few individuals that are spoken of as having become saved, but, uh, but just a very few. What was the reason? that nobody became saved. As that seed was sown, the devil would take it so uh, away, snatch it away, to use the language of Luke 8, so it could not penetrate the hearts of the believers. And this is the big deal of Pentecost. Pentecost. 
Well, there's a lot of big things about Pentecost in A.D. 33, but, but this big deal is that God poured out His Holy Spirit. God Himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit, now entered into that gathering, into that congregation, and this has been characteristic of the congregations all through the church age. Uh, and he applied that word of God to the lives of those that he wanted to save and restrained Satan from casting that, uh, taking that seed away so it could not be sown in the hearts of those individuals. And this was very, very effective, a very effective binding of Satan because we have the definite account from the Bible that at that Pentecost, about 3,000 were saved. And that is really what God is talking about in Revelation 20, when he says that Satan was bound and cast into a pit, so he could not deceive the nations anymore. It was in that limited environment in which, or that limited way in which Satan was bound. He could not keep the seed that was sown from being blessed of God in the hearts of those that became saved. So that seed that entered into the hearts of those who became saved beginning at Pentecost, uh, in one sense were the believers themselves. They were the elect of God, according to the parable of, of the sower. But in another sense, it was the gospel that, that found root in their heart. And once we become saved, we're inseparable from the gospel. We are totally involved with the gospel because the gospel is inseparately connected with the Lord Jesus himself. He's the very essence of the gospel. And we are the body of Christ. So we see all, how all of those figures tie together. We are, as that seed, that, the wheat is being sown. But something that we hadn't thought about, that we hadn't thought about was that Satan, that wily old devil, is not standing idly by. It doesn't mean that he's not operating in the churches. Oh, he can't frustrate the word of God, but he's very busy in those churches, very busy. Go back to Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. We begin to read these verses with some new eyes as we, as we contemplate this. Notice, now these are seven churches. These are local congregations where Satan has been bound. He cannot frustrate the word of God from entering into the hearts of those that God plans to save. There are people becoming saved, and, and yet Satan is very active in these young churches. And that was already back after they had only been established maybe 25 or 35 years. Look at verse, look at verse uh, uh, 9 of chapter 2, Revelation 2. God is talking to the church at Smyrna. And he says, I know thy works, I'm reading Revelation 2, verse 9, and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. All right, now, historically, we've always read this and decided, well, out there are the synagogues. They, they had been used of God uh, as a custodian, as a steward of the Bible, and now God is finished with them, and they are all together under Satan's control because the gospel isn't there. They don't want the Lord Jesus Christ. But here are the local congregations, and they're safe and secure. But the fact is, what is to keep Satan from beginning to operate within those churches by sowing within these fledgling churches, and even as those churches mature and grow, sowing seed that are weeds or tares. That is, bringing into the church people who are not saved. He was not 
bound from doing that. Hold your finger for a moment in Revelation 2 and go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now here is God speaking to the church at Corinth maybe um, 30, 40 years after it had been founded and using that occasion to speak to us. That is to the local congregations that would spring up all through time. And he's talking about, in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Can you begin to see something developing here? In other words, Satan has been bound. He cannot frustrate the true gospel as God carries out his work of bringing into the harvest all of the elect of God. For three and a half years and earlier, in all likelihood, uh, Satan has been able to frustrate that work so virtually nobody became saved. But now the church age has begun, and it is God's plan to evangelize the whole world, to use those local churches, to send the gospel into all the world. And Satan, wherever that gospel is preached, if there is a true, if there is someone who is elect of God, God is going to save that person right now if uh, in God's own timetable. There's no way that Satan can frustrate that. But here are these local congregations, and God has established this new institution of local congregations. This is going to be his methodology to get the gospel into all the world. And so here is Satan. On one hand, he can't stop that gospel from saving those who are to become saved. But what else can he do? What else can he do? He can come in like an angel of light. He can. He is the father of lies. He's the master deceiver. And he can put into place in those local congregations ministers who are not saved. If someone is not saved, who is their allegiance really to? Is it to Christ or is it to Satan? What happens when we become saved? We read in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 that we're translated out of the dominion of darkness, that is Satan's dominion, into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. So that means those who are not saved in the congregations are citizens of Satan's kingdom. We've never thought of it quite that way, I don't think. But suddenly we realize Satan is sowing the tares. He is placing into these local congregations where the true gospel is being proclaimed more or less faithfully and which God is blessing in the lives of all the elect. But amongst these, there will be those who are angels of light, are ministers of righteousness who are still citizens of Satan's dominion. And can the elders and the deacons, as they examine this one,